Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, August 13th, and this is the weekly market update. Disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this podcast or video is not to be taken as investment advice. I'm not a registered investment advisor. I cannot possibly know the facts and particulars of each person watching this video's situation. This is for information purposes only. It's your money. Do your own due diligence. Be responsible for yourself. Okay. So, you know, we like to talk about the magazine covers and the contrarianism that can be, not always, but in a large part, large portion of the time can be evident. You know, we had the recent legislation that has been passed now by the Senate and the House. It's obviously going to go to... Uh, the president's desk, he'll sign it, of course, uh, for this hundreds of billions of dollars of, I don't know, it's it's a kind of a reduced Green New Deal, if you will. I haven't had time to go through what people are parsing it. I mean, guys, so regardless, you know, I'm not going to get into the particulars, but all of these bills, these things are, you know, just part of the military industrial congressional complex, rentier class way of grifting money off the nation's taxpayers and the nation, the national wealth. That's that's what this is. This is political patronage. This is uh, present party in place, um, able to, you know, get their grift on and supply unearned wealth to and subsidies and tax credits and all kinds of other stuff to political um, supporters. Now, the same thing happens when the Republicans are in power. This is the problem and why, you know, uh, Eisenhower uh, called it the military industrial congressional uh, complex, because it's not just, you know, without the Congress, you couldn't have a $850 billion defense budget. You couldn't have multi hundred billion dollar grifts and giveaways for the rentier class, you know, the banking, finance, now this ESG thing. But uh, I think this is going to be peak ESG. Why? This doesn't work. And, you know, people's standard of living is going down. And as I've said before, they're not going to put up with it. Uh, we've seen it already uh, starting to manifest in Europe. You know, we've seen various governments um, go away. I think what you're going to see is, and we're going to talk about in slides here in this um, this week's presentation uh, about how energy prices are getting to the point where people are just going to be poor and they're not going to put up with it, not in Western Europe. I mean, as long as they allow elections, now maybe they'll cancel elections, maybe Klaus Schwab has a plan and they're going to, this is all, you know, but I, I, I don't think this has been orchestrated like this. I think that we just have a bunch of dumb people that uh, are that put in place by the rentier class, the finance class, uh, bankers, and, you know, they're there to pass legislation and put things into effect so that people that put them in power can make more money. I mean, that's basically what I look at. And this, this isn't going to work. I mean, um, I mean, this is what they do, right? They put this cover here. You see this lake that is floating solar. I mean, this is, you know, this is not how you're going to empower an industrial economy. I mean, it looks good. It's a great picture. It, it, it kind of gives you that, you know, the, the, how it fits into the nature and, you know, you get that vibe and it's not working. We have real live laboratories that we've seen. It has not worked. Germany's in chaos. Was, you know, they had the energy transition, energy vende. It doesn't work. It's not working. Um, California is another lab real-time laboratory and if you want to look at sri lanka where they've actually put esg mandates in place where they've actually cut fertilizer use and crop production declined the following year so this stuff doesn't work now if you want to kill a bunch of people and you want to impoverish a bunch of people that works but i'm not going to have those kind of discussions on here because you know that starts getting into you know a lot of conspiracy it's very entertaining i know for people but uh i don't think people are that smart and i don't think that with each person on earth making thousands of individual decisions each day that you can somehow 
control all these people and hurt all these people. Uh, like I said, the world is now bifurcating into a multipolar world. Uh, I think that the West is going to continue down this uh, self, you know, ritual seppuku and uh, bowing down to these ESG gods until they're overthrown, uh, which I suspect they will. I mean, you're going to see a rise in populism in Europe, in my view, and you're going to see populism. Uh, you're going to see people come into power that have left-wing populism and right-wing populism. And you're already seeing that. Italy right now, the right wing is going to come into power. I mean, I don't think that any of these people are going to solve the problems. The problems are insoluble at this point. They are, as I've said before, the problems are so big now that there's nothing that can be done politically uh, to uh, solve them that would that the people would go for. You, you almost have to have a complete collapse and washout. And this is what happened like in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union completely collapsed the entire the entire ideology uh, was discredited without a doubt. The place had to go through, you know, you know, a complete, you know, dissolution. The republics, you know, went away. That's what you need to see something like that. And it just forces the change that's necessary uh, just because there's no other options. Uh, right now, um, they're going to keep doing that. Right now, you're going to, as I'll show in the slides, more subsidies, they, they're going to put price caps, they're going to nationalize the energy industry, whatever, all these things are not going to work. These problems were all caused by political interference in the market. A lot of people don't want to hear this. You know, a lot of people have trust in government. A lot of people believe in government. They want to believe. They have to believe because most people, first of all, don't think these things through. They just don't have no interest in it. They just assume when they flip the light switch, it comes on. They just assume when they go to the grocery store, there'll be food there. Um, secondly, uh, you know, they have a childlike belief that these people are going, these technocrats are going to align everything and, you know, pull the levers and turn the dials and push the buttons and, you know, that, that everything will be fine. And why, why would you give these people, why would you think that? What, what have they done previous to being in political power that would give you the view that these people have any kind of expertise in anything. Like I've said before, I wouldn't give most of these people a broom job on a factory floor. But, you know, that's, that antagonizes people, I know, because people don't want to think for themselves. People don't want to be responsible for themselves. People don't want to, you know, uh, look at the mirror and say, I'm responsible for myself. They want to say, well, somebody else will take care of this. Somebody will take care of my retirement. Somebody will take care of my medical bills. Somebody will take care of all of this. This is not how it works in real life. And we're starting to see that. And this is just a manifestation. I mean, these political classes in the West, the West is in decline. It's corrupt. These people are just there to grift and peel off and cream off as much as they can until this whole thing implodes. And if you can't see that, that's just my view. You might have another view. Maybe you think that people like Olaf Scholz and Ursula van der Leyen, where is Ursula, by the way? We haven't seen her in like a month and a half. And, you know, is she hiding in the bunker, you know, because the incoming uh, realization that she's basically just a fool? I mean, where are these people? What's the big plan? Where's the Marshall plan to fix the issue that, you know, basically Europe has, you know, wedded itself to cheap Russian energy? and now doesn't have and, and is just trying to cut it off like you would cut off like an arm or a leg and not you know wonder what's going to happen to those arteries that are bleeding out so you know even if they want to fix this problem it will take years this is not something that's just going to be this winter it's going to be years to fix these problems and i've seen nothing except for band-aids that's what politicians do right they're not interested in saying we have to have a marshall plan that's going to cost a trillion dollars we're going to do this 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 and this and we're going to work together and we're going to have a a grid that so many nuclear plants and we're going to you know this is what we're going to do and build all these lng plants what where is all there's no plan it's you know give subsidies um talk about putting price caps on energy which doesn't work if you've been in economics 101 and you know some people talking about nationalizing the energy companies and businesses well that doesn't lead to more supply either so you know these governments create the problems they come up with solutions so-called to fix the problem which makes the problem worse and then they come up with another solution it's band-aid on top of band-aid on top of band-aid it's the old dandelion problem if you want to get rid of dandelions in your yard you have to get them by the root you can't just pull 
the little puffy thing off and blow the seeds, it's going to pop up again. You're not dealing with the root cause of the problem. So we'll see. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I haven't seen anywhere where this has really worked. Yes, you can point out a country like Costa Rica or Norway, which has other hydropower. I'm talking about large industrial technological places with a lot of people that are going, this is going to, you know, you're going to run on this. It's not going to happen. We've already seen that in Germany and California. We've already seen what the effects are. So I wanted to talk about, you know, I mean, the oil price is kind of surprising me, you know, with all this talk about recession, you know, 2008 type drop in the economy. A lot of people have sold off oil. You know, we've had a lot of discussion, especially in like Twitter spaces and stuff, smart people. Well, the paper market's overwhelming the physical market, yada, yada, yada. You know, nevertheless, the oil price is holding up, even with this economic uh, contraction. I mean, we're, we're definitely in recession in Europe. We're definitely in recession in the U.S., in my view. Um, so we should be seeing a decline. You know, remember that the Federal Reserve can't may make any more oil or natural gas or food or anything. All they can do is raise rates, crush the economy, and then the second order thinking is if the economy declines and economic activity declines, then energy usage will decline. Ergo, the price will decline. So that's all they can do. And so they have competing mandates, right, to get their inflation under control, but yet, you know, maintain economic growth. And so we'll see what happens. Uh, again, my view is they, you know, we saw the beginning now, uh, a lot of people kind of bagged on the president, but he was actually right. I mean, year over year, the inflation rate was 8.5% this last uh, report, but the month to month was actually zero. So it looks like it's peaked. I mean, energy prices have declined quite a bit. Other prices are coming in now, used cars. There's been a lot of uh, used car price declines. Um, real estate prices are coming down in many, many markets. That's going to feed through to the... Um, owner's equivalent rent. So I think that, you know, we've seen the peak, but I don't think we are going to go back to 2%. You need to, you know, prepare yourself for that. We're not going back to 2%. Wages are too strong. Other structural items in the economy are not going to allow for that. Um, and so I think, you know, the instruction is from some people that I've been looking at or reading some of their, uh, writings like uh, Lynn Alden and uh, Tavi Costa. I think you, your model is the 1970s. You know, you get these periods where you're going to get a spike and you're going to have an overall for the decade elevated average inflation rate, shall we say, with spikes. And then, you know, the Federal Reserve will come in and try to get that under control and you'll come down, but you won't go down to those old levels of 2%. You'll come down to, you know, 4 or 5% and then you'll spike again. Uh, and then, you know, so you're going to have a lot of volatility in these numbers, in my view. And I think energy is going to have a lot to, lot to say about this because, you know, if we look at the fact that, you know, a lot of people say, well, if you feel strongly about the price of agriculture and some other things going up in price, you just need to buy energy because energy underpins everything. So when the energy price, you will see a lot of correlation between these prices, okay, because energy is going to drive a lot of these things. And we simply do not have enough molecules for everybody. And this is the problem. So, you know, somebody posited that, uh, have we put ourselves in a situation where even if we go through a recession, economic activity comes back, are we limited it? Have we put a governor on it because we don't have enough energy? So what we're saying is because we haven't made the investments, because many countries don't have access to, you know, reliable and fairly economic uh, energy, you won't be able to come out of some of these recessions because the energy won't be available at a reasonable price. As soon as you start to have economic growth, the price of energy will surge and then it'll be like a governor on the economy. So these are interesting things to think about. But right now, you know, the energy prices are holding up pretty good. I mean, natural gas is over $8 in MCF in the US. I mean, it's out of control in Europe. It's, you know, it's crushing Europe. But you know, the oil price, I think, uh, over 90 WTI, close to 100 Brent. And so why is this? What are some of the things I'm looking at? Um, we talked a little bit last week about, you know, where we are. I like to give these kind of like mile posts to stop and think about, you know, if we should continue um, in a lot of these 
energy related businesses or stock investments. Why? Because if you look at the re Q2 results, they were awesome. I mean, I, um, I have spent the last few days, last week, couple weeks looking at uh, a lot of the EMP producers, record cash flows. What are they doing? Paying down debt, announcing shareholder uh, positive returns of capital via share buybacks and dividends, which is what we projected would happen. We've seen several companies even put out on their slide decks, when we get to certain debt levels, this is how much cash we're going to return. And so, you know, that makes sense in the current price environment, but what happens if prices drop to 80, 70, 60? So, you know, this is what you have to think about. So where, where are we at with these oil prices? What do I think is going to happen? So, now, the caveat here is as soon as I start talking about this, uh, then the oil prices will start dropping on Monday. But I mean, this is how I'm currently looking at things. So data is showing that demand is price sensitive, which is what we saw. You know, we saw diesel six, yeah, you saw all those headlines. But what happened is, you know, what happened, what you saw is a lot of the wholesalers and a lot of gas stations, they held off buying more fuel then the price drops, right? And then consumers kind of pulled back. They weren't driving as much. We saw that in some of the gas buddy data. But as soon as the price kind of came in, the demand came right back. So that's interesting to me. We're not seeing this huge, huge runoff in demand. Why? I mean, look at the unemployment rate. Look at people working. I mean, people are still working. We've said unemployment's a lagging indicator. We're starting to see more, you know, announcements of jobs uh, being cut, but we still have quite a bit of people working and we still have a lot of economic activity. These things take time to, to cycle through. So right now, uh, demand's price sensitive, but it has bounced back. Now, the thing that I'm interested, in, one of the main things I'm interested in seeing is, you know, when they announce the inventory data every week, the one thing that I do think in my mind is, okay, how many barrels were released from the SPR? Because that's a temporary phenomenon. What would have happened if we wouldn't have used the SPR releases of a million, 800,000 to a million barrels a day, whatever it is for that week? What would we, 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 have, we would have been in, you know, these, we would have been in shrinking inventory. So the point is, is that the SPR is not, you know, a cornucopia of oil that's going to last forever. In fact, the current schedule is to end in October, which is conveniently right before the congressional election, because the whole goal of the SPR releases by the Biden administration was to hopefully, in their minds, put some supply on the on the on the market and lower oil prices, and then ergo gasoline prices would go down because voters, the hoi polloi, are very sensitive to gasoline and food prices. So. Uh, that's not going to last forever. So after the November election, regardless of what the outcome is, there's no need to do that. So I suspect it's going to end because you can't just keep, I've tried to find some data on this, but you know, it goes kind of without saying that I don't think you can just drain the thing to zero. Okay. I think there may be just like in a pipeline, some engineering constraints on that. So, um, but I don't, I couldn't find enough data on it, but suffice to say, and I also think there's some legislative, uh, constraints on how far you can drain this too but you know we've seen that the rule of law and laws can be changed so nevertheless if anybody has information on that that would be great to know in the comments so what happens when that million barrels per day goes away you know if we're close to 99 to 100 million barrels a day of demand on the world then these spr releases are representing about one percent of the world supply you know commodities as we've said before resources they trade at the margin. And so a 1% increase in demand or supply can really skew things. And so we're already in a uh, market with a low inventories, and then you're gonna take a million barrels a day away. What does that do? Uh, that'll be interesting to see. Uh, I suspect that uh, that's going to, you know, if inventories continue to decrease and you don't have that million barrels a day, that's going to be reflected, I think, in a price signal to the market to get more oil. Um, OPEC spare capacity, I think that, you know, with, I think we kind of, you know, I think after Biden went to Saudi Arabia, he got a commitment for 100 or 200,000 barrels a day. That's nothing. That's not even drops of rain in a pool. And 
you know, I don't think the Saudis and people in OPEC, you know, with the relationship being tarnished, what's their incentive? They have a depleting resource, probably worse off than anybody really knows because they have very aging oil fields. And so what's the incentive for them to flood the market with oil and drive the price down for something that once it's exhausted, they have no replacement. So um, they don't really, I think the market has coming, is coming, has come, is moving towards the realization that OPEC, the call on OPEC will not be answered. When I say the call on OPEC, the, you know, for them to increase production, you know, we still have other OPEC members, Angola, Nigeria, several other members, they just cannot increase production. You have the ongoing war in Libya that can swing production by a million barrels a day itself, uh, just based on whether the terminals get closed, whether, you know, there's uh, combat going on in those areas. So it's not, it's not going to be a reliable producer. Then you have, you know, the so-called ban on Europe using Russian oil by the end of the year, something like this. I'm getting confused because of all the variances that are being given and dispensations that are being given and some of the shicky Mickey that goes on games playing where you, you know, Russia sends oil to India, they refine it into diesel, jet fuel and gasoline, then send it to Europe as product. Um, I don't know. It's anyway, long story short, you know, we've seen there's, that that's not going to be a savior, right? Russia is going to be an issue one way or another. Um, and then at some point, you know, does China relax its COVID lockdowns? So I've seen that another lockdown in another city uh, yesterday. So I don't know if this is going to end. You know, you, I think the rest of the world's come to the realization that it's now just basically an upper respiratory virus that everybody's going to have to deal with seasonally, which is kind of what we said from the beginning would happen. If you remember, many people chastised us for that, but uh, this is where we're at now. The CDC basically, you saw what they did yesterday. Uh, but China coming back could be, you know, 2 million barrels of demand. So you could have, you know, with the SPR and, and, and the Chinese demand itself, that could be 3 million barrels swing right there. I mean, that's going to force the price of oil up. This is what I'm talking about. Um, I think another interesting phenomenon that's starting to come into the market, and I heard this on another Macro Voices uh, interview. I can't remember the guy's name. Michael Hayes, I think. I don't know. Um, like two weeks ago. Um, and I found a, a another snippet of information. I'm doing more research on this. But fuel switching in Germany and other countries short of natural gas, right? That could be 500,000 to 1 million barrels a day. And what are we talking about? Well, you know, a lot of power plants and industrial facilities um, use gas turbines to produce. Well, in a power plant, obviously, you have a gas turbine. It burns natural gas. Uh, the exhaust of that goes into a heat recovery steam generator, which creates steam. So you have the generator on the gas turbine creating electricity. You uh, have the heat waste heat from the turbine goes into a HERSIG, you capture that heat in a boiler, create steam and goes to a steam turbine. An industrial facility like these huge chemical plants, they use the same thing. What they will do is they will create electricity on the front end, use that waste heat from the turbine and these heat recovery steam generators and send processed steam. Most of these refineries and chemical plants have huge steam demands. I mean, millions of pounds an hour of steam demand. Uh, and that's another product. So these gas turbines have to run. So if you're short of natural gas, you can theoretically, in many cases, not theoretically, but it can be done. Uh, you just change the combustion, um, the, the ability to burn fuel oil or natural gas. Remember, these things are basically jet engines, okay? Um, in many cases, like in General Electric has an aero derivative. It's derivative of its uh, you know, jet engine. They have the big heavy gas turbines uh, which, you know, are, are 7FA and things like that. But these things, uh, from what I remember, and uh, can be switched uh, with some modification to burn fuel oil, diesel, uh, whatever, um, in, in, in many circumstances. So you're seeing more of that. So if that comes back, and then not only that, in many countries where you're going to be short of electricity, diesel generators are just, just pop up everywhere. If you've been to any developing countries, de developing world countries, you'll see generators running all over the place. So um, what is that going to do for demand, you know, if we see significant fuel switching? So that'll be interesting. 
And then, you know, long, medium and long term, there simply is not enough money being reinvested in new production. It's interesting because if you look at the oil field services sector, it's really coming back. Um, it's really beaten down. There, there's not a, a consensus in the market yet that it's back. Um, we're in early in the actionable intelligence alert newsletter. We have quite a few, um, quite a few oil field services companies. And I've had a couple of people write me and say, well, you know, is this it? You know, they're not really participating. Look, the realization, the perception in the market has not changed yet. These um, investments in oil field uh, services, I mean, if you look at all the earnings and reports that I was looking at, every one of the companies just about that I have in the portfolio reported um, increased earnings, cash flow, sales, backlog, all the metrics are going in the right direction. The comments in the conference calls has been positive. Many companies raising forward guidance, many companies talking about uh, that we're in the beginning of a new up cycle. Now, it's probably not going to be a boom, but we're already seeing it like in day rates in offshore rigs. We're seeing it in onshore. Uh, we're seeing it all through the oil patch, okay? And the comments are positive. Now, these things aren't just one or two quarters. They typically last several years. So I think there's tremendous opportunity in oil field services. I've been saying that for a while. The prices really haven't taken off yet, but the prospects that these companies continue to improve. I mean, I like one of the uh, uh, offshore service boat uh, suppliers that's debt-free, just took over another one of its competitors and uh, has basically got full utilization of its, of its craft. And so it's seeing rates starting to go up. OK, that's what we're seeing, especially with a lot of the drill ships and big, heavy duty semi submersibles. These things are kind of getting starting to get sold out and day rates are starting to go up. People are signing contracts. People are, um, you know, go, have to reinvest somewhat into uh, replacing reserves. And I think, you know, over time um, that will happen. You know, the, the current zeitgeist is to return cash flow as much as possible to shareholders but eventually that's going to that's going to start shifting and more you know especially if, if i think oil prices go where i think they're going to go which is you know to record highs at some point over the next couple of years then there's going to be a tremendous push to reinvest and like i said the industry is not it's so atrophied at this point that that wave of cash flow is going to create like the biggest boom in in, in oil field services you know, we're even seeing it onshore. There's, you know, a lot of people focus on the big players, you know, and these big shale plays, but there's a lot of private companies that are reinvesting. You know, if you're a private company, you don't have shareholders. And so if you have the ability to drill a well and get a return at these prices, you're going to do it. And so there's where a lot of the activity is coming from. You know, the publicly traded companies obviously are in the shareholder return mode, but the private companies are, are out there drilling. So we're seeing that being reflected in many of the uh, reports that we're looking at. So this is what I was talking about. Uh, I guess this came off a, you know, somebody uh, grabbed this screenshot. I don't know. Um, I tried to find more information about it. You have to be careful when you just have a single source like this. But I heard this also on a podcast. Uh, somebody was talking about this. Uh, Siemens Energy CEO said that uh, customers in Germany are requesting gas turbines to be switched to run on liquids most notably oil. We just talked about that. That can be done. How much of an effect that's going to have, the ability to do that, I don't know. But that's what people are going to do, right? They're going to do whatever they can to adapt and overcome uh, the situation. And so here's, uh, here's what we look at, right? Inventory. So this is uh, OECD. This is the uh, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, basically your developed countries. Industry oil stocks versus Brent futures price. Here's the price of oil on this side. Uh, and here is the inventory. You see that as the inventory goes down, this is uh, flipped over, if you will. As inventory decreases, price increases. So that's what you would expect. That's what we've seen in the past. That's what we'll continue to see. So this is what I look at. What are inventories? Is demand being destroyed sufficient so that inventories are allowed to build and therefore have a, a dampening effect on prices? So far, we have not seen that, um, but anything's possible. And then how far, how far can we build inventories? Like I said, uh, we'll have to see, you know, the world, 
you know, the world doesn't stop just because the United States and Europe are in recession doesn't mean the rest of the world's just sitting still. So, um, it just, this is, this is what I look at. I've said this from day one. So I, you know, it's not fun to watch prices of your companies go down, but when I look at the share buybacks that are happening for many of these companies, then they can just buy shares back at a lower price. And then ultimately when we do get a, turn in prices to what I think are going to be well over a hundred dollars a barrel at some point, And the market comes back to our position, then, you know, we're holding shares. There's less shares. Right. So, um, but you know, nothing set in stone. There's no, nothing saying we can't have a drop down to 80. There's nothing saying we can't have a drop down to 60. I don't know. I'm not a fortune teller, but, uh, I, I am, this is what I look at. So uh, here's an article, um, I think it was from Bloomberg. I had to go on the web archive to get this because some of these things are password protected or you got to be a uh, paying member. But uh, Japan Energy Chief says more nuclear power needed to avoid crunch. More nuclear reactors must be restarted for Japan to ensure stable power supply for next summer and beyond, according to the nation's newly appointed trade minister. Quote, Beyond next summer, it's important to keep restarting new nuclear power plants. The government will work with operators to make sure they comply appropriately with safety inspections and will work to gain the support of local municipalities. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida said last month that the government will do what it can to ensure as many as nine reactors are in line this winter. So there it is, folks. We've talked about this for a couple of years. Japan doesn't have a choice. I mean, energy security, the ability to deliver the molecules uh, is energy security, which is economic, political, and social security. Uh, if you don't have it, you're in trouble. The Japanese realize this. They have they have 33 reactors sitting there, and they need to restart more. Um, I have a graph coming up here that shows where they were before Fukushima and where they're at now. They have a tremendous amount of opportunity here. Um, why do I point this out? Several reasons. Uh, nuclear is a growth industry around the world. I don't really care what happens in the EU and the United States. Uh, they're in decline. The rest of the world's coming on hard and they're building more reactors. I will put, put a link to the, uh, there's a report out, I think from the World Nuclear Association. It goes country by country. You can see what everybody, every, all these countries are doing, how many reactors they have, kind of like a status report for the year about, which country is doing what, how many reactors they have running there, you know, and you can, if you read through this, you, you get that the consensus view is that nuclear is, has to be, will be a part of the generation mix going forward. And for Japan, it's doubly important, right? They have no natural resources of their own. They, they are forced to import virtually all of their natural resources. So um, having this bulk load where you can just get this condensed, really concentrated, dense form of energy, you know, why would you not take advantage of that? They have to at this point. So here's what I'm talking about. Here's the nuclear electricity production for Japan. This came out of that report. You see where we are currently, where we were pre-Fukushima. Um, yeah, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for growth here. And, and, and I believe it will it will come eventually just out of necessity, uh, as I think that Doomberg said, coined the phrase, politics or physics will trump politics uh, eventually. And that's what we're starting to see, not just in Japan, but other places around the world. Meanwhile, uh, Europe braces for impact. Here's your French, German, one year forward electricity prices, uh, you know, up around 450 euros uh, a megawatt and in France, 610. So this is really awesome for if you live in Europe, right? Um, I don't understand how you're going to be competitive economically like this. Forget about just the economics of German industry or any kind of industry in the EU with these kind of prices. Uh, what happens, like I said, in the winter, I think of many people uh, in these places, you know, it's summer now, people are on vacation, it's warm. People have this vague sense that it's a problem. Somebody needs to do something, you know, and especially I think, you know, I don't want to speak for European people. We have great viewership here from Europe. Many Europeans comment. So I will let them comment on what they think, what they 
are seeing and hearing amongst their colleagues and friends and family about what people think about this. But this is uh, this does not look good for this winter. And I think a lot of people are kind of in that, you know, well, I'll worry about it when it comes mode or the government will take care of it. You know, a lot of people around the world, especially in the West, still have a lot of trust in their government, like we talked about at the start of this program. Uh, I'm not one of those people, but many people do. And they just feel that, hey, these people, these technocrats, these people will, they'll solve the problem, right? They're in the government. They'll, they know what the problem is and they'll solve it. But uh, I think that's dangerous. This is, this is crazy. Uh, this is really insanity. And I don't know how much longer this can go on. I mean, this is, this is, uh, I don't understand how the German economy can absorb these power prices. I mean, the industrial powerhouse that it is, this small and medium sized uh, family owned for decades, you know, machining operations, factories uh, that are incumbent, uh, you know, that are a main source of employment and part of that, industri that German industrial juggernaut. And this just does not compute with that. This is not going to work. That's not going to work with power prices this high. So I don't know. Uh, this is really going crazy here, maybe because it's the summer and it's really hot. Uh, but uh, this is even elevated at these prices back before it got super hot was not not good. So we'll see. Um, so we have this uh, slide also. This is year on year residential electricity prices in selected European capitals. You can see, obviously, the darker colors are May 2022. The the um, light blue is the previous year. So what happens, you know, next year? I mean, when I read a lot of these articles about these prices, a lot of the commentators say, well, this is temporary. It'll come down next year. But will it? Because we had this problem of these high energy prices even before the war in Donbass and before the sanctions on Russia, before all of this happened, we already had an energy issue in Europe. And um, so the, the the war has just put gasoline on the fire, if you will. So this is crazy. I think this is going to lead, this is going to lead to political change is what I think this is going to lead to people. I mean, look at look at like Italy, for example. I mean, it's more than doubled the electrical pr the price. I mean, look at the UK. I mean, that's crazy. I mean, in Germany, the prices were already high, but they've, you know, a lot of these places, you know, look at the Netherlands. I mean, that's crazy. So I don't know what the, you know, a lot of politicians are going to lose their job over this, uh, which is not a bad thing, but the incoming politicians, they don't really have a plan to solve it either. So um, yeah. Look at Austria. I mean, they're 100% relying on on Russian gas. There, this is people are people are not going. They can't deal with this. They're gonna. There's going to be calls for change. So I put this on here. I don't mean to be sarcastic, but uh, this is a Google searches uh, for firewood in Germany. I guess that's what that word means. I didn't look it up in Google Translate. German. Uh, viewers can correct me if I'm incorrect here, but um, that's crazy. I mean, you have the basically fourth or fifth, I think fourth largest economy in the world, uh, an acknowledged manufacturing and technological powerhouse, i.e. Germany, and people are scrounging around for firewood. I mean, something doesn't match here, guys. Uh, this is crazy. And, uh, you know, we'll see. So I thought this was interesting. I'll put in a link to these articles that I can that I was able to find. But this was an interesting, uh, you know, Germany considers lifting fracking ban. Germany's energy supply crisis has sparked a national political debate about whether the country should lift its ban on fracking to allow development of untapped natural gas reserves. As a result of Russia's war in Ukraine, there is growing concern in Germany that Moscow will completely cut off its gas supplies. Russia has already reduced gas to 20% through its Nord Stream 1 pipeline that runs under the Baltic Sea to Germany. Elsewhere in Europe, fracking is also up for consideration. In Britain, there have been calls to lift a moratorium. In the Netherlands, there is a debate over extending production in Europe's biggest gas field, which is scheduled to end this year. 
so there you have it, folks. Uh, the conversations are happening, right? Uh, we, I've talked about this many times, you know, back in 2008, when oil prices hit like 147 or $150 a barrel. I mean, even Nancy Pelosi was talking about the possibility of drilling offshore California and lifting the moratorium. So, you know, politicians main objective is to stay in power, keep their job. And so, you know, when things get bad enough, they will, you know, they will start talking about these things, whether they come to fruition, I don't know. Even if they did agree to do these things, it would be years before you would see any results. Um, but, you know, you never know, right? I think it's just interesting that, you know, I think the view is with a lot of these politicians is they, they're hoping that the winter won't be bad. This thing just self-resolves itself. They don't have to do anything uh, because I think a lot of them are going to have to walk back their rhetoric or their belief systems. I mean, what are the greens in Germany going to say? I mean, if you read the article, of course, they're against this. They're against nuclear. They have no solution. So you have Habeck running around the world, scrounging for any kind of molecules he can get. There are none. And so therefore they're in a, you know, they're in a jackpot. And so you see these calls from some of the other parties to say, hey, look, we got we got to uh, we got to look internal if we have resources here. And I don't even know. I haven't done enough research. I know that they did some like in uh, Great Britain. There was some fracking going on in some big shale field, but it started causing earthquakes. So they put a moratorium on it. So I don't even know if the reserves are there, if there can be exploitable. Uh, you certainly don't have the infrastructure there like you have in the United States to have this huge natural gas drilling industry that can come online, it would take years. So, but I think it's interesting that the conversation is at least happening. So uh, like we talked about before, UK households facing 5,000 pound energy bills. You know, that's the pound sterling, uh, five, this is crazy. I mean, I mean, that's like $7,000 US. So what's the article say? British households face average annual energy bills surging above 5,000 pounds next year, according to the latest forecast, which will heap further pressure on the government to intervene to ease the spiraling cost of living. Of course, let's have the government intervene who helped cause the problem to begin with. Surging energy bills has become a key issue in the ruling Conservative Party's leadership election that will appoint a new prime minister to replace Boris Johnson. So what are they going to do? So the Conservative Party is going to do what? Well, we know what they're going to do because they're already starting to do it, right? Give stimmies. They're not going to put, they're not going to sit down and say, we need to have a, a conversation about the next 20 to 50 years of energy policy for this country, which has to include fossil fuels. They are too far down the road with this zero carbon WEF agenda, zero population, zero carbon, hate their own people agenda. So what are they going to do? Turn on a dime and say, well, we got to build these nuclear plants. we got to frack here. we got to get the North Sea cranked up. we got to, you know, do the things that a normal person or manager would look at and say, okay, here's the problem. Here's short-term, medium-term, and long-term solutions that we can implement. It's not going to happen. They're, what they're going to do is they're going to intervene in the market again. So rising inflation and concerns that sky high energy prices will tip the wider economy into a deep recession as households cut back on spending have led to calls for more aggressive government intervention. More aggressive government intervention from additional financial support to an overall of how electricity markets function. That's what we need. We need more government inter intervention into a problem that was in many cases caused by the government. And so here's another article Oh, I kind of misspelled this. One third of Britons face poverty over the energy bills. Nearly one third of households in the United Kingdom will face poverty this winter after paying energy bills that are set to soar again in January. Campaigners say about 10.5 million households will be in will be in fuel poverty for the first three months of next year, according to estimates from the End Fuel Poverty Coalition, meaning that their income after paying for energy will fall below the poverty line. In May, the government announced a 15 billion pound package of support, including 400 pound payments to 29 million households for October to ease the burden of energy bills. So this does nothing. The high energy bill prices have to be sufficient to force demand down. 
force people to individually make decisions to do that. But the people, government doesn't trust its people. The government doesn't want to come out and provide leadership. The government doesn't want to do that. So it says, we'll give you more money. So then the people continue to use the same amount of energy. Okay. Low prices cure low prices, high prices cure high prices. Yes, it's painful, but you know, this is what's required because you have no long-term policy. Do you think a politician is going to come out there and say that? They don't say that. You know, the public, they look at the polls, the public's ticked off about the high energy prices. Let's give them a stimmy. Okay. Let's throw some money at them and that'll solve the problem. It won't. Craig Lowry, a principal consultant at Cornwall Insight, said in a Tuesday press release that if 400 pounds was not enough to make a dent in the impact of the previous forecast, it most certainly is not enough now. So if you have a third of the people, if this is accurate, and there's actually a third of the people in the UK that are going to be into poverty because of the high cost of energy sucking up all of their income, then I can tell you that there will be political change in the UK. It's just that simple. So I wanted to talk about this. This has happened. You'll notice that this basically kicked off um, basically around the invasion. You know, as the sanctions started to go into effect on Russia over the over the uh, Ukrainian, the Donbass war. Um, and why? Because you've, like I said, if you let the market do things, it will find the cheapest way to get the products to the markets where there's demand. If you start throwing th sanctions and start disrupting all of those supply chains artificially by government fiat and decree, then you're going to create longer travel times, a whole bunch of things that lead to these higher tanker rates, right? like we talked about before, where you have a place like India, which is sucking in crude from Russia, refining it into refined products and then shipping it to places. And then those places turn a blind eye that the products that they're using are a derivative of Russian crude. So this is why you're seeing this. And it's being reflected in uh, the tanker stocks that we have in the portfolio. They've performed rather nicely. Um, you know, I don't know how long this goes on for. We'll monitor it, but uh, I mean, this is, when you have a fixed cost business like tankers, or relatively fixed cost, I mean, fuel's a variable cost, um, and then you double rates, I mean, that's why we're seeing record cash flows and profits in some of these companies. And so I wanted to point this out. Um, these are the hunger stones. I can't really read these, but supposedly from the article, um, back in, like in the Middle Ages or different times when they had droughts in Europe, they would engrave these stones, you know, as the water receded in the different rivers or tributaries, they would engrave these stones um, and to show, you know, if it dropped again, you would see that the last time it did. And, uh, you know, I just thought it was interesting because we're seeing, you know, rivers in Germany now starting to uh, get to low levels because of a drought to the point where you can't have barge traffic, which is further exacerbating the energy crisis because you can't ship coal now in some areas. And barge traffic is limited because, so this is what happens, right? When you make bad policies, it's kind of that Murphy's law thing. When stuff starts going wrong, then more things, you know, that you didn't anticipate happen to come onto the scene and just make the problem even worse. But I thought this was interesting. I think these are from like the 1600s. I really can't read these, but, uh, the article said that uh, they were from like the 1600s or something like that. So another thing is for all the maniacs that are saying climate change, I mean, it's not like this is unprecedented, these low levels and this heat, we've seen this before. It's called weather. You know, climate does change. It, it, it fluctuates within a band. And so we've seen this before. So I wanted to talk about uh, Ford Motor Company. Um, raising the price of their electric vehicles. Why? Because of significant material cost increases and other factors. Yeah, the other factor is they're going to try to capture that um, legislation, those new stimulus payments and incentives for electric vehicles. The Detroit automaker adjusted the MSRP on the F-150 Lightnings for the first time since it was revealed in the spring of 2021. Since then, industrial metal prices for batteries, including nickel, manganese, cobalt, and lithium, have jumped. 
forcing the automaker to raise the new EV truck price up to $7,000, depending on the model. The F-150 Lightning's new MSRP is now between $47,000 to $97,000 for a freaking pickup truck, up from approximately $40,000 to $92,000. Prices exclude destination delivery, yada, yada, yada. Even with the tax incentives, EVs are still unaffordable for many Americans, despite the Biden administration's commitment to decarbonizing transportation. Biden recently said his 2030 goal is to have half of new light duty vehicles sold in the U.S. as EVs, including battery electric, fuel cell electric, and plug-in hybrid vehicles. So this is what happened kind of in college education, right? They kept raising the subsidies and the grants to students. So what did the universities do? They kept raising tuition to capture those subsidies and grants. This is the scheme. This is the scam. This is how it works. Um, this is the grift. And uh, yes, the prices of these metals have went up, but you know, so have the incentives now. And so Ford Motor Company is going to do everything it can to capture as much of that as possible. You're not going to have the majority of vehicles at any time in the near future be electric vehicles. It's just not, we don't have the infrastructure, the materials don't exist, and they cost too much. It's just that simple. They just cost too much for the average person. That's, you know, we just went over how people are struggling because of high energy costs. So how, how are you going to do this with more government intervention in the market, with more subsidies, with more, I mean, I, this, this isn't how, you know, legitimate, um, healthy economies work. This is command and control economies don't work, but that's an argument for another day. Okay, guys, that's it for this week. Um, we'll talk to you next week. And remember that uh, you can support us by liking, sharing, commenting, or taking a subscription to the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter, 150 bucks a year, or sign up for my Patreon. If you sign up for my Patreon to support us, um, if you contribute at least five dollars uh, a month, I will uh, give you a a sampling of our latest stock pick in the portfolio. That's a one shot deal. Many people think that that's every month. No, it's not. If you want to support us, you can that way. And I want to introduce you to the writing that we do and some of the picks that we pick and why we pick them. And so I will give you that one one time sample issue to introduce you. So if you're interested in that, you can go and check that out. I would also say that the Actionable Intelligence Alert um, website is back up and uh, that's available. I've been starting to post on there. I'll be posting uh, things during the week uh, on there for your information purposes. And uh, you can find that at uh, actionableintelligencealert.com. Okay, guys, talk to you next week.